electrical signals. Like in muscle, electrical properties of cells result from ionic concentration differences across the plasma membrane and from the permeability characteristics of the plasma membrane. So, action potentials. Remember I told you action potentials are action potentials no matter where they happen. They're electrical signals produced by cells. Um, they're import an important means by which cells transfer information one from one part of the body to the other. I have a stimuli, light from the eye, sound from the ear, pressure on the skin, that gets carried up through a sensory neuron to my central nervous system. My central nervous system then perceives the environment. We've got the complex men mental activities like conscious thought, memory, emotions, <clears throat> the ability to act, um, and uh, the, like with the contraction of muscles, we move because something is touching us, we don't want touching us. It is all dependent on those action potentials. Action potentials do all of that. And then once I decide, again, let's say I stepped on attack, I need to send another action potential out to my muscles to get my muscles to move. Now, internally, this is supposed to be a cell in a beaker, if you can't see that. This is the cell, this is the beaker, and this is the fluid inside the beaker. If you look inside the cell, remember, cations are positively charged, anions are negatively charged. Inside the cell, I have 200 milli equivalents per liter of cations. Inside the cell, I have 2 milli equivalents of anions per liter. So I've got positive 200 and negative 200. If you add those two things together, you get zero. So internally inside the cell, I have a total charge of zero because I have the same number of positives as I have of negatives. Inside the fluid in my cell, I have 155 milli equivalents of cations and 155 milli equivalents of anions. Again, if you add those two things together, positive 155 and negative 155, you zero out, you get zero. So I'm in my beaker again at a total charge of zero. The thing is, Looking at the 200 versus the 155, there is a difference between what is inside of my cell here versus what is outside of my cell here. And in your body, that is also true. What is inside your cell is not what is outside your cell. So how do I maintain that difference? How do I keep that difference in place? One thing is I've got the sodium potassium pump. We talked about this in our muscle cell. It pumps three sodium out for only two potassium in. That means that I've got three pluses inside versus only two pluses outside. Another thing, the permeability of the plasma membrane. We also talked about this in chapter nine. If I have 500 leak channels for potassium and I've got three for sodium, well then, potassium can get in and out of that cell really easily. I've got 500 leak channels for potassium. Whereas if I only have three for sodium, sodium's gonna have a really hard time getting in and out of that cell because I don't have as many leak channels for that. And that literally is just the permeability of that plasma membrane, what's actually present. <clears throat> So let's talk about that sodium potassium pump. Here is the inside of my cell. Let's see. The inside of my cell. Here is the outside of my cell. Okay? So I've got the inside and I've got the outside. If you look inside the cell, I have low sodium. If you look outside the cell, I have high sodium. If you look inside the cell, I have high potassium. If you look outside the cell, I have low potassium. Now remember, every time that we've talked about things diffusing with no energy, it doesn't require any energy, we talk about that car that sits on top of a hill. If I'm going from high to low, there is no energy required, right? Going from high to low. However, <clears throat> 
if I am having to go from the bottom of the hill to the top of that hill, I need energy, right? Now this is the thing about the pump. I am going uphill when I move both of the ions that I'm moving. I'm going from a low to high concentration when I'm moving sodium, and I'm going from a low to high concentration when I'm moving potassium. That automatically means I need to have energy for this thing to work. That's why we call it a pump, because we need energy for it to actually function. So looking at looking at our pump, notice that I've got sodium coming into this binding side here facing inward inside to my cell and look at those binding sites they're perfect for sodium three sodium fit in fantastic well once i get those sodium in remember sodium is low inside and high outside so i'm going from low to high i'm going uphill what does that automatically mean? I need energy. So ATP comes along and it breaks apart. And when it does that, when it breaks apart like that, it gives this sodium potassium pump energy. Okay, so these are my lightning bolts. I know, just go with me on the fact that they're lightning bolts. So when I break this ATP down to ADP and phosphate, leaving that phosphate attached, I'm actually charging up this channel or this pump. Remember, I'm going from low to high. I've got to have energy. So when I charge it up, it is allowed to then change its shape. See how it's facing in here, but now it's facing out here. Now, why is that important? Because I'm trying to get this to go from low out to where it's high, right? So if that's what I'm counting on, if that's what I need to happen, I have to have energy. Well, as it changes its shape, right? Look at the binding sites here. Look at them here when they were facing inward. Look at them here when they're not. Now, would this fit in here? No, it wouldn't, right? So it's kind of like taking wet hands and wet soap and squeezing it. If I squeeze a bar of soap and it's wet and my hands are wet, it's going to go and just shoot out of my hands, right? Changing the shape of these binding sites here basically ensures that I spit out that sodium, okay? Now, this is the thing about that. Remember I had three lightning bolts on this side. Well, I used those lightning bolts. I used that energy to get these out. I still have two lightning bolts over here. I still have a little bit of energy over here. Okay, something else I want you to compare. Look at the binding sites on this side of the pump here versus the binding sites on this side of the pump here. Do you see how they've changed? This is very, very teeny tiny and look at how big that binding site has gotten. So, um, the conformational change expels sodium to the outside and the extracellular potassium binds. Now look at this. Potassium is low outside and high inside. I'm going from low to high. Do I need energy? Yes. Remember, I still have half of the energy or a little less than half of the energy I started with when I broke down the ATP up here. I still have this. 
So now that those binding sites, hang on. Now that those binding sites are free and ready, potassium can now bind. So potassium binding triggers the release of that phosphate that we actually put on it up here, right? When that lets go, we use that spare energy that was left over to go back to our original shape. Excuse me. So when I go back to the original shape and that phosphate falls off, technically, I have used this energy. So now these binding sites that were perfect facing outward have shrunk. Remember the whole soap, wet soap, wet hands? Well, now I'm spitting that potassium back inside. So the loss of the phosphate restores the original conformation. So we've got this pump using ATP to get this conformational change to happen. The binding of cytoplasmic sodium to the protein stimulates the phosphorylation by ATP. I charge it up. Phosphorylation causes the protein to change its shape. The conformational change expels the sodium outside of the, um, and extracellular potassium binds. The binding triggers the release of this phosphate, which triggers the conformational change, restoring it to its original shape, conformation, spitting the potassium back inside. Potassium release and sodium sites are back to their original shape, basically receptive to sodium coming back in. And this repeats over and over and over. It happens all the time. Every single second of every single day, you have the sodium potassium pump doing this. Now, something else I want you to notice because this is going to become important when it comes to our resting membrane potential. Okay? How many sodium are going outside? That's three positives because it's three sodium, right? How many potassium are coming inside? That's two potassium, so that's two positives. So when this guy is working, I'm actually taking more positives out than I'm bringing in. If you think back to chapter nine, I said that the inside of the cell was slightly negative compared to the outside. This right here is one of the main reasons why that is. So using active transport, the pump moves potassium and sodium against their concentration gradients uphill, okay? High sodium outside the cell, high potassium inside the cell. Now, the permeability characteristics. We've got leak channels, we've got gated ion channels. Ligand gated, voltage gated, other types of gated channels, we open and close when we want things to change. But if we're just talking about a cell in general and how it's put together, the leak channels kind of determine how it reacts to the environment. Now for our muscle cell and for our neuron, pretty much the, the percentage of leakage channels is about the same. We have tons of potassium sodium, or I'm sorry, potassium leak channels, whereas we don't with sodium, meaning that if my cell is resting, Potassium can get into and out of the cell with no problem, but sodium has a really hard time because I don't have as many leak channels. That is a general permeability characteristic of that plasma membrane. It is very highly permeable to potassium because I've got like 500 of those channels, but it is not very permeable to sodium because maybe I have three, maybe I have two. There just aren't that many. Leak channels for our um, class, they're just always open, okay? In reality, it isn't that way, like I've said before, but for the sake of argument, for the sake of our sanity, we're just going to say that they're always open. 
each channel is ion specific. That's why we call a potassium channel a potassium channel, because literally the only thing that's allowed to go through it is potassium. The number and type of leak channels determine the permeability characteristics of the resting plasma membrane. Again, if I've got a high number of potassium leak channels, then potassium moves. If I don't, then it doesn't. Ligand gated channels are still the same thing as before. If you've got the key, you open. If you don't have the key, you close. Voltage gated channels are the same as they were before. If you're the same charge as what's inside the cell, you are going to basically stay in your little hidey hole and not allow that channel to be open. If for some reason the charge inside the cell changes though, then I will move and that opens that channel. Um, Mechanically gated channel. Mechanically gated channel can be something like a touch receptor and mechanical means physical. There's actual physical movement there, like bending your arm or cracking an egg open. With a mechanically gated channel, you actually have to pull this apart physically in order for that channel to open. I always think of somebody taking an egg in both hands and cracking it open and as they separate their hands from each other the egg opens and the egg falls out so you've got you know one hand over here one hand over here and you've got half of the egg over here and half half of the egg over here and that opening is caused because your hands are actually splitting apart that's basically what a mechanically gated channel is. It's a mechanical receptor. You literally have to pull this for it to split apart. You have mechanically gated channels in your ears, believe it or not, that help you to hear. A temperature receptor. What could possibly make it change its shape? Yep, temperature changes. Temperature ch changes probably change its conformation, change its shape, which means that it opens or it closes based on temperature. Both of these are actually found in electrically excitable cells, specific ones, but we're not really discussing those, so don't worry about it as far as um, knowing where you find them or anything like that. Do I want you to know how they work? Yes. So establishing resting membrane potential. Inside of the cell, you have the same number of positives and negatives. Outside the cell, you have the same number of positives and negatives. We just saw that with the beaker. But between the inside and the outside, there's a difference in charge. Again, we just saw that with the beaker, with the cell that was sitting in the beaker. We had 255, or I'm sorry, 200 inside the cell. We had 155 outside the cell. So there is a difference between them. Um, the difference between the outside and the inside is called the potential difference. Why is it called the potential difference? Well, it's called the potential difference because it has the potential to change. Literally, when we were looking at the muscle cell, the minute that we saw sodium rushing in because channels opened, there was a change in charge, right? So that can change. That's why we say it's a potential difference. Now at resting membrane potential, resting membrane potential is always the same. It means there is no signal going through that cell. So at resting membrane potential, we're saying a cell is completely unstimulated. Now we do say that the cells are polarized. They're polarized because there is a difference between what is inside the cell and what is outside the cell. If I'm measuring what's happening in here and what's happening out here, they're not the same number. So we say that they are polarized. Establishing resting membrane potential. Resting membrane potential is established when the movement of potassium out is equal to the movement of potassium in. It's balance. We have the same number of potassium inside at all times. So if I lose one on one side, I gain one on another side. In other words, it's balanced out so that there isn't like all of these fluctuations in concentration. Sodium, chloride, and calcium have a minor influence on resting membrane potential, but the major influence also, um, always comes from potassium.
Um, in the, a cell, the plasma membrane isn't really very permeable to sodium chloride or calcium, but it is very permeable to potassium. That's why we say that potassium is the important one here. A concentration gradient that is established in a cell wouldn't be possible without that pump. Remember, we just talked about the pump and all the steps with that pump. The pump ensures that we're pumping three sodium in for every two potassium out. Basically what that means is we've got three positives leaving for only two positives going in. What that ultimately means is I will ha always have slightly less positives inside than outside because I'm basically taking out three and only coming back with two. <clears throat> So everything that we just talked about is right here. And if you want it all in a nutshell, there you go. I'm not going to go through the table though. So depolarization versus hyperpolarization. Remember, polar means different, right? So if there is no difference between the outside and the inside, the number would be zero. Okay. So when I depolarize, I'm making that difference smaller. So I'm at negative 70 when I'm at resting membrane potential, I'm coming up toward that zero. I'm making this difference here smaller in this case. I'm going from this much difference to this much difference. In other words, the inside of my cell is becoming more positive, okay? How do I do that? Well, I can increase my membrane permeability to sodium or calcium because both of those are outside of my cell like crazy, but not inside. If I start pushing them into my cell, then I'm making the inside of my cell more positive. So I'm basically making this difference smaller. I'm depolarizing. Okay. Hyperpolarization. Okay. Hyperpolarization. Polar means different, right? So if I'm hyperpolarizing, I'm making this difference even bigger than what it already is. I'm going from a little bit of difference to a lot of bit of difference, okay? So the charge in the cell becomes more negative. How can I do that? Well, what do I have in the cell that's positive that will leave? Potassium. If I start leaking potassium out because I have more potassium inside my cell than outside, that'll make the inside of my cell more negative. Remember that chloride is a negatively charged ion, okay? And right now, the membrane is not very permeable to it. If I open channels for chloride and this starts flooding into my cell, well then I'm putting negatives into my cell. That will also make the inside of my cell more negative. While sodium is not moving a lot into my cell or out of my cell, it's still moving. Even with just those three leak channels that I mentioned previously. So, if I decrease the ability of sodium to even come in, that would also hyperpolarize my cell. Because remember, sodium's a lot more on the outside than on the inside. So it wants to come in. It's just that I don't have very many doors for it to do it. But if I cut off those doors, then even that little teeny tiny bit of sodium that I'm getting in to make the inside more positive stops, meaning it gets more negative. 